this is a video that I originally made with Dr. Mark Bull um, for his um, coach education platform. So you'll, you'll notice that the, you know, the, the content is for coaches on how to help um, players with the yips. Um, but I also thought it would make a really good video um, for, for, for you guys and anybody who's struggled with their short game or maybe has had the yips. There's some brilliant interventions here that are not technical. So what you'll notice is that there's four or five kind of interventions and none of which talk about technique. Um, but if you've struggled with your short game, you've probably exhausted the technical idea and there's some brilliant um, things to try here that, um, that can really make a big difference to, to how you strike it uh, and, your, and your movement in general. Um, if, you, if you want to kind of skip past some of the coachy conversation, then I'll put the timestamps below for, so you can get straight to the drills. Please make sure that you, go to the, that you watch it through to the end drill where we talk about different grips because as we know from, from Max Fitzpatrick and you know, his reverse hand grip, changing your, the way you hold the club can really make a difference if you've struggled with anxiety and, and the yips. Um, as always, you know, if, you've, um, if you enjoy the video, please click subscribe and that will help me create more content like this. And if you hit the notify button, that will make sure that you don't miss out on future videos. Hello and welcome to this edition. Always gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Noroso into this video and really discussing possibly and perhaps not maybe the most emotional or emotive discussion in golf, the idea of the yips, or even does the yips exist in a very, very fun way. So really looking forward. I actually know absolutely nothing about this. So oh, lucky, I'm a, lucky you. Uh, in a very kind of blessed. So, so this is me almost as a completely zero student in some ways today. But if someone actually asked me what the yips is, I would go, well, it's, it's a disruption somewhere. That would be my level of understanding. It's a neurological disruption somewhere, something maybe. But I know nothing about this. So it really gives me kind of great pleasure in some ways to really be that kind of complete zero student today, to really understand the idea of the kind of yips or even the, the kind of yip deny in some ways. So maybe now we can look at as you move through this. And always, always, thank you so much today. Absolute, absolute, absolute pleasure. Mm. Uh, th thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a subject that, um, that I've spent a, a lot of time around. I, can, I remember, I remember in my, in my teens um, being quite yippy. Maybe did I have the yips? Yeah, probably I did. And, 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 and even then, I, I sort of noticed if I if I put my attention in certain places, it somewhat inoculated me from from the effects. So I mean, that was as a as, as a sort of an eighteen year old, and and since then, as I work with players and players with anxieties and yips, I, I've kind of taken alternative approaches to the subject. So it's become, uh, you know, and, and and tied in with my with my research, it's become quite a quite a thing for me, and and um, it is an area I would say I probably do specialise in. Um, if nothing else, because, and, and, I do, and I do do a lot of coach training on this, because there is nothing worse than being a coach and standing in front of somebody who is yipping it and, and just feeling absolutely helpless. Um, so, so myself and, 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 and Gordon Morrison, who's, a, who's a, a colleague of mine and an excellent coach, Gordon is doing his PhD um, specifically in the yips. Um, so we, we felt, you know, we should try and offer some kind of coach training around this because that feeling of being utterly helpless and just serving people more and more technical information and watching them get worse is a horrible place for, for a coach to be in. So, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are certain ways to, to work with, with people who have, who have the yips. So I guess that really leads in some ways then, Noel, does that actually that the yips even exist in life? So is there such a thing as the yips? What is it? Does it exist? Um, so if you can maybe elaborate and expand on that, I think that'd be a really good place to start through this tutorial. Yeah, because, um, um, you know, there are, I mean, I, I've been present with, um, with, with coaches who've said, uh, you know, there, there is this idea that the, 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 the yips, that there is no such thing as the yips as such. It is just, just poor technique that leads to anxiety and then, and then you get kind of you know, a little bit stuck with it. Um, so, I mean, we've got to look at that broadly. The yips, the yips is something that happens in, in a multitude of sports and activities, um, in music, anything that has sort of fine tuned, um, technique and timing. Um, uh, lots of musicians, particularly brass players, will struggle with the yips. Um, dartitis, where they can't release the dart. Cricket bowlers, the, you know, baseball pitching, where they sort of lo absolutely lose the timing of it and can't can't get anywhere near the n near the plate. I mean, it's it's a very it's a very common um, phenomena uh, amongst a lot a lot of sports. And, uh, and you, you can't I can't imagine that that it's just poor poor technique in all in all of these in all of these areas. Um, and also, if it was poor technique, then then just cl cleaning up the technique would work. But we know we know that that's often not the way. Um, technique is definitely a big part of it, and and this is why I think um, as as coaches we are best in the best place to work work with this. Um, mo most of the people that, that come to see me have seen a sports psychologist, a generic sports psychologist, and a hypnotist, and you know lots of lots of other um, fields, and, and obviously lots of coaches as well. But having that combined approach of technique and um, 
and uh, and and psychology and and attentional awareness is is the way to go. So, is the what was your question? Is the yips a real thing? Does it exist? Does it exist? Well, I mean, the yips. If we were going to define it, would be um, I think the best way to define it is um, is um, it's that it's that kind of electric movement that kind of runs through us, which is not it's not conscious and it's kind of out of our almost out of our awareness. Um, I think the word is involuntary. It's an in, involuntary movement that happens in, in the motion. So, so somebody has these really great practice swings and then when they stand to the ball, it doesn't look anything like that. Uh, and you can say, oh, you know, you need to make it smoother. And that's, that's, that is not, if it was just about being smoother, then, then, then they would have done that already. So it's, a, it's an involuntary motion that we, that we see. Um, two types of the yips, there are, or, or you know, we should probably say that the you know, uh, movement science doesn't understand the yips fully. I don't think it understands it very well at all, actually. Um, um, so w whenever I'm working with somebody with the yips, I definitely do not say to them, and I make it very clear that I do not possess the cure to the yips. There is no, th this is not about um, me and my wonderful skills of curing you, but I, I do have a history of working with it and I'm going to help you see it in a different way and understand it differently. And, and let's set our ex expectations from the start. If we can be playful with this and, and do things differently, we're going to loosen the problem. And, and often people kind of skip away from that first session and feel like, crikey, I've totally got a hang of this. And, you know, and, and sometimes it takes, it takes a number of sessions and time and patience and, and empathy. So, you know, we're not saying we've got the, we've got the cure-all here. Um, so, yeah, I would say y the yips definitely exists. And for, for um, science, it sees it as two things. It sees it as, as a new, either a neurological thing where there's literally some sort of wiring misfire of which there is no cure for other than, and this happens by the way, other than Botox injections in the muscles, so they don't fire. Can you believe that goes on? Mm -hmm. um, so when neuroscientists get involved, that they, they take that approach. And then there is the, the, the other type of the yips, which is more kind of anxiety and technique based. Now, I've got to say in all the yippers I've, I've worked with over the years, which would, would be in the hundreds, I think I've probably only had one, which I would say is unworkable. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of hope there. And I think the other thing, the other thing that is misunderstood about the yips is, uh, and this comes from, from Gordon's study, is um, in experienced golfers, there is around 35 to 40 percent of those golfers that would have reported of having the yips at some point in their game and normally chipping or, or, or putting at some point. And that's a, that's a huge amount, isn't it? When we, you know, when we think about the yips as this, this thing that the odd person struggles with, it's actually a lot, a lot more common than, than you might think, which is, why, which is why we kind of all need to be aware of, of kind of how we, how we work with this best. Hugely. Um, it's like the kind of, if you've seen Tad Lasso, the program, don't mention the Y word. And they kind of mention it once and oh, it's, oh, you've mentioned the Y word. And it's a complete meltdown and that kind of stuff. So, so in that case, can we kind of look at some practical examples maybe, Noel, as far as, you know, a, a kind of a yip situation. So say playfully, I'm very blessed, at least I hope so. I've never been exposed to knowingly yeah. the yip. So can I almost kind of almost kind of act out you and I today, a very live example of what could happen when I stand there and go, that kind of typical kind of almost yip kind of movement. Yeah, yeah. What sure. approaches can we then really kind of look at that? And it's interesting you mentioned that around the idea of involuntary. I mean, you look at, say, more anatomy and physiology, that's what a really, really a muscle spasm would be. It's an involuntary action. Oh, my back's under spasm. So there's kind of some crossovers, perhaps, there's some connections somewhere between anatomical yips in some ways could be defined as a slight spasm. Right, like, okay. Oh, my yeah. kind of, you know, my, yeah, my yeah, QL, yeah. my rectus spine is all active. And it looks like that, doesn't yeah. it? It looks like a, that kind of... You're almost electric. constrained in movement because of this involuntary signal the brain has sent, which the kind of QL was grabbed, to then spasm has often been um, shifted somewhere else. So can we almost act out, for example, in this case, if I was to do a very small pitch shot just to the green there, in that kind of very often mm. that very kind of almost kind of John Cleese attempt at doing the yips in some ways. Okay, um, so what, well, well, what we one of the interesting <clears throat> thing is when you ask a yipper to do it on purpose, <laughs> they struggle <laughs> to do that. I'm actually playing golf Thursday, so be sensitive to me. Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah, let, yeah don't, don't, don't be acting out the yips. We'll tell, tell you what we'll do. We'll do, uh, I'll give you like a, like a top five things we'll do, a real sort of quick and dirty, uh, a, a number of quick interventions you can do and, and be playful with your, with, with your, with your students. Um, uh, and I mean, the, the, the real skill comes in, in working with a student and seeing what's working, why it's working and, and kind of how, how, how you, how you would, um, bring these, bring these exercises into, into their game. But, um, I, I think we can, we can go a long way just by int introducing a few really, really simple kind of interventions. Very good. So, um, um let, let me just hop in there if I may. So I think the first thing, first thing to understand is, is, you know, the, the yips, so the yips comes in putting, it comes in chipping, full swing yips. I mean, th th these are all, these are all different things. And 
probably most common is the chipping yips, isn't it? Um, so, things about chipping yips, the yippers do it in different ways and it, and it presents slightly, slightly differently with each. But if there was one thing I would say is, um, is common, almost universal with chipping yippers, is that they are overly focused on the ball and the whole, the whole sort of being is about making contact. And, and that makes sense, doesn't it? If you've, if you've, if you've had the chipping yips, contact is, is everything. So the so first thing to do is to try and um, defuse and, and widen that, that attention from the ball to the, to the larger movement. So um, first things first is I would give them the exercise to be much more aware of where they want the club to finish in the backswing and where they want to finish in the through swing. I should say at this point, you know, as, as a golf coach, we've already looked at the technical ideas and cleaned up the technique to make it very simple. Often when, when yippers arrive, there's a whole lot of technical thoughts that, that need to be just abated. So I would develop a very simple technique for them, almost putting-like, and then we go into the sort of widening of attention. So rather than thinking about hitting the ball, I would invite them to say the word one when the club gets to the end of the backswing, the scuff of the ground, and say two when the club finishes. And the aim of the exercise is to keep that awareness wide so that we're not staring at the ball and our, our whole kind of attention isn't about contact. It's more about where we say the one and the two, or if I'm honest, it's more about the two. If we can really get to two and be accurate, then we know that we've taken their attention somewhere else. So uh, uh, as a coach, I'm looking at when, when the club finishes, when they say two, and I just ask them, did you say it early or late? So if they go uh, one, two, then clearly that was very early at the ball and not, not when the club mm -hmm. finished. Um, should we have a quick go at that, Mark? Absolutely. So Mark, mm. Mark's never done this exercise. Um, Using the stripy ball now? Oh, or uh, uh, ball? we'll do that in a minute. Okay. So just with a normal ball. So pitch it to the... Uh, yeah. Okay. One, two. Okay. Okay, well done. Where was the club when you said two? At impact. Pretty much at impact. So you, so you felt you said it a bit early? Yeah, let's, let's do it again. So, yeah. yeah, pretty close. Great. Let's, let's, let, let, do you like let's it? Do, that do you again. like two to be impact? Two needs to be when the club finishes. My mistake. Okay. Right. So you know, the, the, you, you might recognise this from the well, from, from the inner game of golf. Two. Notice we are not saying it at the ball. <laughs> this is not about back hit. We want we want Mark's attention yeah. at the end of the swing. Definitely not at the ball. And most yippers will say at the ball and they'll say it very loudly. One, two, with you know, as all that kind of anxiety around contact comes out. I mean, that felt again. My my experience is very calm. Again, quite soothed. Um, not slow as in a slow movement. Just there was time. Brilliant. There was time to move. Was my initial experience of that. Let's do that. Let's do that one more one more time, if you don't mind. One, two. And when did you say two relative to the club finishing? Slightly after it finished. <laughs> like a day late. Yeah, slightly after. <laughs> that was really late. Which, you know, and again, I'd be playful, it's not a problem, but it means your awareness wasn't quite where it was. Yeah, okay. Quite where it needed to be, should I say. And again? Yeah. One, two. And that time? Pretty much it finished. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well done. So, um, it's important he gives me the feedback because we're trying to draw Mark's attention in, into that. And of course, as well as, as well as taking Mark's attention away from the ball and the hit, we are, we are trying to promote that, um, that commitment to the through swing. And, and there's good research that thoughts about the through swing are, are, are hugely helpful on this. But we're trying, to, we're trying to garner that sense of commitment to movement. And we've almost changed the task to making a smooth movement to the end and not, not all about well, It's actually not aware of impact. I mean, my whole... Brilliant. Um, objective was say two at the exact moment in time I finished. Yeah. So again, you know, my my understanding was the club felt a little longer through impact. Again, ridiculous con thoughts, but the ball was stuck to the face longer, which we know is completely inaccurate on every level, but more in a playful way. Um, but I had no uh, intent on impact. It's all around say two just here. Brilliant. And whenever whenever I'm under under pressure and and all the sort of negativity comes up, um, that would be where I'd go to. I wouldn't. I mean, I've done the exercise. Yeah, a fair bit. I wouldn't need to verbalise it, but I can I can kind of get the benefits of that exercise by really putting my attention at the at the end point of my swing. And there's lots of motor learning research around why end point is a great way to funnel your coordination. By the way, I would I would be, I'd be really focused on on how I want the club to finish and and really key not to be staring at the ball. So on that note. Um, staring at the ball so so there is attention on the ball and of course there's our as our visual gaze and if you think about 
think about your as a, as a coach and a good skipper your your um, gaze on the ball you'd probably think well actually when I'm chipping really well and I'm just round the green and having that yeah in in that sense of flow I'm probably not really staring at the ball but yippers are, are likely to be extremely focused on the ball and often are staring at a part of the ball and have all that kind of self-instruction going on so i would try and try and widen that 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 vision and, and i have to say this exercise is often and you will know very quickly by the way it's often brilliant and often completely ineffective so just be open be open to that mm -hmm. uh, and and i don't know the science behind it i don't know why we'll just playfully try these things so what i would ask the player to do is i first of all discuss the idea of peripheral vision and we might sort of do a, an exercise where we where we can you know, where we can see, see our fingers out here um, at, at the same time, so our, our vision is wide. So we need to understand peripheral vision. And then I would ask the player to have a few practice strokes, scuffing the ground, and I'll place a ball like a, a, a yard and a half behind and a yard and a half forwards of the ball, uh, of the scuff, and ask, ask Mark, in this case, to focus on those two balls while making a good ground contact. Okay. In doing so, of course, widening that, that field of vision. So we put, and, then, and then we just put the ball in there and again I'd make a, a skills challenge rather than um, this is something that's going to change your golf. Can you build the skill of keeping your attention wide? <clears throat> so um, how well do you feel you managed to, to keep your attention wide? Yeah, pretty good. And, and you're able to see those, those balls at the same yeah, time? I mean, it's, I guess the idea of kind of foveal versus parafoveal vision. Um, much wider and but again you're being really kind of narrow focused and precise yeah. and you know the, the whole the, it's just about that spot so, so, so let me just stop you there so so uh, if, and that's another thing with the yippers they are trying to be really precise you know, there's a certain freedom of movement that comes from from a, a confident confident player mm. if you've not had that then you are going to be trying to be overly precise overly controlling yeah. um, and then your vision will go that way as well i mean interesting it was almost um which board do I look at first? <laughs> Which is the foveal thing, isn't my, it? <laughs> it was kind of that kind of um, right, left, right, left. So again, ironically, my initial thought was to look right, backswing, which right. kind of almost circles back in some ways to the idea of kind of end point research. Now, I need, actually need to look more left, as yes. it would be in my case, yeah. um, from that much more kind of paravoveal vision. But you were able to, to eventually sort of yeah. look, at, yeah. look at the both at yeah. the same but time. This, sequentially, it was kind of right, left. Yeah. But I mean that that, that that is a that is a key topic. I would say if there's other if there's another thing that is really common with with yippers, it is over control. I mean it is about really kind of trying to steer and put the club on the ball, and and, and in that we lose that sense of connected awareness and playfulness with with the club and trusting in our in our in our body to deliver the deliver the contact and you know we get overly involved in the motion. Um, that is is definitely part of part of yipping okay um let's do uh should we do another exercise absolutely right, we're, gonna need a few, we're, gonna, we're gonna need a few, a few balls for this one um so um we'll be right back okay so we're back and and i've set up um five balls uh, in a line here and and this exercise is all around um building trust and uh, building rhythm i mean rhythm is a big part of it and this is what i like about these drills there's always a mental aspect to it and there's also a physical and technique aspect to it and in this, in this exercise, the mental bit is, is um, building trust in the motion and not getting overly involved and trying to sort of find impact. And, and then there's, there's a rhythm aspect as well. So probably before I, I do this exercise, I talk to the player about how much, how much they're trying to control the club. And that, that conversation goes, um, goes like this. Um, I would ask them um, to think about the motion of the club and to equate how much of that motion of the club is down to what you're doing at this end and how much is it down to the the sort of momentum of the head and and yippers would normally say it's kind of heavily sort of 90 percent here as they try and control it and you know and i would explain that my motion is more sort of 30 me 70 of the head as i allow the head to, to flow and then to experience that we we do this drill so i've set the five balls up in a line and the aim is to have a few practice swings before the first ball but keep the club moving at no point do you want to stop the club moving so this this motion becomes kind of automatic and I'm really letting the club um, flow freely. Obviously, I'm aware of the scuff in the ground because that's what good shippers do. Keep the club moving and then and then step in and see if you can just just you know, strike them away. Thin that one, but don't worry. Just keep it moving. Um, 
And, and oftentimes, I mean, that would seem like quite a hard task, but oftentimes um, it's actually a lot easier. It's a lot easier than kind of starting from a stationary position. And, um, and what, we're, what we're trying to do here with the, with the player is really kind of break that, that idea down that, oh, I've got the yips and there's something going wrong with me, uh, and, and just sort of bring some, breathe some, breathe some air into the room, if you like, and, and, and it kind of loosen the, the situation and get some confidence that actually I can start to kind of trust the fluid motion. Um, the, the first few may not go well, again, playfully, just to set them up again and again um, and, and see how it goes. Oftentimes, that is a real game changer, but not always, you know, always be open to, to having to, to kind of adapt and, and change. One more? One more. That is probably, that is probably the, the best tool I ever bring to, to, a, to a, um, a yipping situation. So it's a foam ball. So, we, you know, we've talked about, haven't we, we've talked about the, the, the need or the desire of a yipper to really kind of stare at the ball and put contact on it. When you put a foam ball down, that kind of relationship with, to the movement um, can often change dramatically. So we would have a discussion around technique, we'd clear all that up, we'd talk about the flow of the motion, in, and in particular, the ground contact. So we'd do, you know, we'd ask them, how heavy do you want to hit the ground? Too much, too little, just right. And I would ask, I would ask them to, to give me really accurate feedback on the, on, on that ground contact. So they would hit the ground and they would tell me whether it was the right amount, too much or too heavy. And then I would invite them to hit the, hit the foam ball and see if they can hit the ground exactly, in exactly the same way. And of course it's the same movement, um, that you know, the ball's not gonna get, gonna get involved. And oftentimes, because it's a foam ball, they don't kind of react. They're not, they're not kind of anxious about the task and they can really build their awareness of the, of the motion and the ground contact um, as they have that kind of mental freedom. So, can they be much more um, at attentive to the ground contact and the flow of the motion and just trust that the ball is going to be, get, going to be struck? And that ultimately is, is the way out of the yips. Um, so, being able to bring those foam balls in and be playful with them, I think can be a real sort of loosener to the situation. So we do a few of those. Sometimes, I mean, someone's so, in, so into this, uh, that has no effect and they even yip with a foam ball. Uh, but oftentimes, as I say, it's a, real, it's a real loosener. And I then might do a few more. I then might alternate foam ball to real ball. And then we start to really kind of get this sense of flow and, and trust in the movement. So what was that, four, four, yeah. four kind of exercises? Um, be open to trying trying all sorts and you know if, if oftentimes i would go left below right with a yipper um i notice matt fitzpatrick is actually doing that now amazingly and, and doing a great job so i've had great success with that um one-handed is a great way to to encourage that that sense of not over controlling it when you get a player swinging one-handed there's a sense of flow and trust to the motion um I would even even consider giving them a left-handed club for a right-handed player to really kind of have them have them think differently. Um, so these are all you know really kind of task-based uh, movement-related related drills. There is on the flip side of that there is also the, the kind of psychology element to it, which perhaps we'd, we'd do in another video around the willingness to fail uh, and acceptance of the of the situation. The more the more we the more we don't want to yip and the more perfectionist traits we bring to this the more it kind of invites this, this um, sort of yippy movement in. And that you can really apply to any shot in the bag. Now, if someone has more of a kind of a four swing yip to a putt yip to a pitch, but in essence, you could kind of apply those philosophies to all. I, I all would points. say so, yeah. I mean, a lot of what we did here in pitching works really well. That commitment from, from one to two, to really commit to the end point and not try and find impact. We, you know, we know that, that we've seen that ball bound movement you know, often in, in full swings as well, haven't we? 